Well, imagine waking up one morning only to find out that apparently you've travelled to an exotic Middle Eastern location and assassinated an alleged arms dealer. Well, that's exactly what happened recently to a number of individuals from Germany, France, Britain and Australia. And as with any great spy thriller, there was a twist. They were all dual nationals living in Israel and their identities had been used as cover by the real killers. Here's Trevor Borman with our report. In an Arab city full of Western faces, they didn't look out of place for a moment. Dubai's airport is a nexus for world travellers. And on January the 19th this year, an unremarkable group of foreigners arrived bearing fake travel documents. The man in the blue tennis gear is masquerading as Australian Joshua Bruce. He arrived hours earlier on this passport. Soon he and the rest of his group will be exposed as assassins and Israel's feared spy agency Mossad will be in the sights of investigators. Dubai being a very small place, filmed on each and every corner, they got a movie. The Arabs have caught up with technology. You just can't do this stuff anymore. You can't risk them on this sort of operation where they get blown for taking out one terrorist. This is the spy story that could well spell the end of old-fashioned cloak-and-dagger espionage. Technology has always served intelligence agencies well. But here in Dubai, it's the spooks, it seems, who've been outfoxed by high-tech surveillance. For Hamas arms dealer Mahmoud Mabhu, it was meant to be a one-night stopover in the cosmopolitan Gulf city of Dubai. The Palestinian resistance fighter was known to Mossad for buying weapons from Iran and notorious also for kidnapping and killing two Israeli soldiers in 1989. This is the Dubai police version of what happened recorded on CCTV. Mabhu arrives from Damascus mid-afternoon and is watched by several operatives. The man in the baseball cap goes by the name of Australian Adam Corman. As Mahmoud Mabhu arrives at the hotel, another man travelling on a fake Australian passport is waiting. Dressed in a blue shirt, he and a pretend tennis friend follow their target to his hotel room and report his room number to fellow agents. The operatives book a room opposite and still more agents move in. And when the Hamas man leaves to go shopping, he's followed every step. Back at the hotel, two pairs of executioners arrive and out of camera range, they manipulate the electronic lock of the room to lie in wait for Mahmoud Mabhu. In the final minutes of his life, the Hamas official arrives back from his shopping trip and into the ambush of four assassins. Police think Mabhu was disabled by an anaesthetic and then smothered. But in the absence of signs of a struggle, for days police thought he died of natural causes. And with agents safely out of the country, it seemed the perfect hit. We're looking at the new world. This world is a, is a highly technological world, and 
on the one hand, this high technology has stopped a lot of crime and terrorism, and on the other hand, it makes the life of anybody that fights terrorism uh, just as hard as it is for the terrorists. Mossad headquarters is a highly secured compound north of Tel Aviv, where only discreet filming can evade security. Neither the organization nor the government it's answerable to will ever confirm or deny responsibility for any mission. So I've come to meet former agent Rami Igra in his office in Tel Aviv. Mr. Igra, tell me what you can about your past with the organisation. I'm a former... I'm a pensioner. That's all. OK. I want to ask you about... Rami Igra's difficulty is that he's sworn to secrecy about his Mossad past, but he's agreed to make some observations about the Dubai hit. Once a team like this starts working, it is very easy technologically to trace them at each and every point of the whole... Uh, of the whole maneuver. Our message, the fact that Israel has might, uh, and the might is uh, military and other, is known across the world. We don't have to advertise. This is a well-known brand name. The international espionage community is trying hard to figure out the Dubai operation. Intelligence agencies like Britain's MI6 are abuzz with chatter and speculation after the killing of Mahmoud Mabhu, and their former operatives are reflective about their own work. Well, British intelligence has never carried out assassinations. In fact, going back to the 1930s, there were even two plans to assassinate Hitler. In 1938, permission was refused because it was believed to be counterproductive. You're just creating martyrdom, you're creating that feel of persecution, and in the long term, that's negative. Harry Ferguson is the former MI6 spy who now writes books with tips on how to lie without being caught and how to follow someone without them knowing. In one sense, this was a successful operation in that they took out the target and all their operatives got back to Israel and are now safe. And the fact that such a large team was used would tend to suggest that they've had to move at very short notice. I suspect the commander was Mossad, I suspect the support staff were Mossad, but the guys with their feet on the ground, who it was known were going to be photographed, I suspect were probably military. Through dogged detective work, Dubai police matched the faces captured on CCTV cameras with passports, and with identification software, they built up a murder story. With help from Interpol, they found most of the fake passports carried the names and details of real people living in Israel with dual nationalities. In the case of the Australians, the photographs of the real passport holders had been substituted with photos of the spies. Every citizen is, in a way, seen as a, somebody who's part of the national force. And therefore, if you've got a passport, I think the attitude of the intelligence service is there, that's an asset we can use. I've come to the Tel Aviv home of Australian passport holder Adam Corman. His namesake was an agent who kept tabs on Mahmoud Mabhu in the last hours of his life. Adam Corman is lying low and has not spoken to the media. Hello, Mr. Corman. I'm so sorry to trouble you. I'm not Mr. Corman. Oh, OK. Sorry. Is, I... is Mr. Corman here? No, he's not here. Uh, is Mrs. Corman here? Uh, no, she's also not here. And I don't think that I can help you. OK. OK. Thank you. Bye. Bye. A neighbour told me the man I met was Adam Corman. Another neighbour told me it wasn't. In Israel, identity can cause great confusion. 
There's no evidence the Australian passport holders were complicit in this affair. But I've been told there's a system here and it works something like this. If you're an Israeli with two passports, be that second passport British or Australian, you can be approached by an official. You're asked if you plan to leave the country in the next 12 months or so. And if the answer is no, you're asked if out of duty to the country, whether you'd be prepared to have your passport details borrowed. It is very stupid of a Western intelligence uh, organization to steal your identity without your consent. Because what can happen is that they are roaming around the world with your identity and then you come along. The flags fly close outside the Australian embassy in Tel Aviv. But this is not the finest hour in relations with Israel. Inside, AFP officers were asking Israeli dual citizens if they had any idea how their Australian passports came to be used in a spectacular murder in Dubai. This is of the deepest concern to the Australian government. We are getting to the bottom of this now. Whether it was cleared with them beforehand is an interesting question. Now, obviously, the people involved say not, but they would anyway. Uh, would Mossad have risked blowing the security operation by telling them? I very much doubt it. But it will be interesting to see whether any of these people who claim they've been so dreadfully wrong try any kind of legal action. I think that would let you know how, how very upset they are. The Dubai assassination is the talk of Israel. Most people here assume it was their beloved Mossad. The shadowy figures on CCTV have been a hit on YouTube and have come to life on the nation's top satire show. We can laugh at ourselves very easily. By making fun of it, of course, you, you play a game which, is, which doesn't really tell you anything about uh, did we do it, didn't we do it, or how do we feel about it, but... Uh, it tells a lot of, it's very cynical, and it's, uh, it's sort of self-denigrating in a way. Most people in Israel are glad Mahmoud Mapu is dead, but they're concerned at the price. If his death was supposed to look like natural causes, then the mission failed because the agents were caught out. But even in a nation surrounded by enemies, some don't believe the end justifies the means. It's state terrorism, and it's immoral, it's wrong, and I think that the people that are uh, responsible for this policy of terror should be in trial, should put in prison for that. We don't have capital punishment in our legal system. It means that as a society we made a decision that we are not going to let the judges in trial to sentence people to death. So how come security bureaucrat, general secret service bureaucrat, Mossad bureaucrat can make such a decision to kill people without trial? Its iron-fisted approach to its enemies is embedded in Israel's heritage. The festival of Purim is the happiest Jewish celebration of the year. It's the biblical story of how a small, oppressed population found the courage to overcome an evil enemy. Welcome to the promised land! The State of Israel has been defending its survival since its foundation in 1948. And its overseas spy agency has spared no mercy for enemies of the state. But to really understand how Mossad works and what it means to this society, you have to go right back to the early days. Well, 
Well, it was the first time that the Mossad grabbed international headlines. It was an international story. Adolf, the Marshal Adolf Karl Eichmann. Adolf Eichmann was regarded as the architect of the Nazi Holocaust. When Berlin fell in the Second World War, he fled to Argentina. Mossad would launch an audacious mission to kidnap Eichmann so that he could be brought to Israel, tried and executed. They wanted, if you wish, a show trial. So that's why the, the order was, don't kill him, bring him live and kicking to the state of Israel. Well, in 61, the Eichmann kidnapping was a kind of a clean, pure, moral operation. But in the 1970s, an atrocity at the Munich Olympics steered Mossad on a path of revenge and retribution. Palestinian gunmen murdered 11 Israeli athletes and coaches, and Mossad's brief was to hunt the organisers one by one. Yes, if you do something bad to us, we may reciprocate. But we would not do it out of being totally mad. We are not murder incorporated. It was one of the most inglorious moments of Mossad's history. A day when everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Palestinian Naim Khatib surveys a vacant block of land in the Jordanian capital, Amman. It was here he became a local hero for a most extraordinary feat, catching two Mossad agents red-handed and turning them over to police. It was an autumn day in 1997 and middle-ranking Hamas official Khaled Mishal was on his way to the office. As he stepped onto the curb, a Mossad agent masquerading as a Canadian tourist lunged at Mr Mishal and sprayed poison in his ear. The agent and his accomplice would be caught, but Khaled Mishal would have 24 hours to live. Mossad's clumsy plan was for it to look like he died of natural causes. With the two agents in jail, Jordan's King Hussein had the upper hand. And the message that was sent to the Israelis was, you will bring the antidote, or I'm going to severe all relations with Israel, cancel the peace treaty, close down the embassy, kick everybody out. But most importantly, the two Mossad agents that we have in, uh, in custody are going to have a public trial in Jordan. It was the low point of Mossad's history. At the urging of American President Bill Clinton, Israel handed over the antidote and the agents were released. Khaled Mashal recovered, and the episode catapulted him to become the leader of Hamas. And an ordinary Palestinian who caught some would-be assassins discovered the frailty of a spy agency. There is fear that Mossad is everywhere and it can be in any city in the Arab world and that uh, everybody is looking back at the last unsolved murders and attacks in this part of the world to try and see what is the connection with the Mossad. I personally don't think that, that assassinations are helpful. Not from the moral point of view. All terrorists are replaced sooner or later. He was not the head of the group. He was not the guy that was calling the shot. I don't think he was that heavyweight that was worth killing. You have to give a credit at least to the planners 
that they didn't use car bombs, they didn't want to kill innocent people, they, ca- they, they could blow up his room. Mossad is overrated. You know, look at the failed assassinations, look at Dubai. I was lazy, he was sloppy. CIA people, they don't like, they don't like this stuff, you know. It's, it's messy. Once you go down that road, you're basically sending the message anybody can do it. Any number of our enemies can say, wait a minute, if it's okay to assassinate cross borders without a declaration of war, I mean, you know, why not do it in Sydney? The point is, when it comes to international law, they can get away with a lot more. Robert Baer spent 20 years as a case officer for the CIA, much of it in the Middle East. In the 1990s, he infamously worked to subvert the regime of Saddam Hussein. In theatres of war and conflict, like Iraq and Afghanistan, he admits the CIA does assassinate. But he's no fan of Dubai-style hits. The Israelis want to seem to be invulnerable. That's, that's part of their policy of deterrence, you know. You kill us, we kill you. And we don't get caught and there's no international condemnation. So to describe this as anything other than a fiasco, I don't see how you can do it. They're Mossad or contractors or whatever, and they are finished, finished. Why would you sacrifice 26 people? It doesn't make any sense. I mean, they, in a small service like Mossad, it's, it's inexplicable. The events in this city on the 19th of January are reverberating across the world. Western governments, including Australia's, are incensed that its passport should be used in this way. You know, the last people you would suspect the Australians of killing people. So, you know, people see an Australian pa- passport, you know, you know people, Australians are popular. Politically, they're benign. It's a great identity. The Australians, I mean, they're, they're essentially screwed. You know, they, you know, they, they cannot completely clear up their names, ever. An oil-rich Arab emirate has come of age and has warned a fearsome enemy that it cannot get away with murder. A death squad has had its cover blown and a legendary spy agency has been all but outed. Retribution is not done through targeted assassinations. They believe, rightly or wrongly, they're fighting for their survival and that they have to get rid of the Palestinians, either politically or or otherwise, uh, in order to to survive. And that's one reason why you assassinate people. You want the others to be in fear. You want to say, look, we did this and we will get you next. 